Well, as uh, Dr. Purvis said, when I want to speak about finishing well. It's not a subject that I'm an expert on because I haven't yet finished well. I hope to finish well. But uh, we can see how this is of great importance to, to Paul as he writes to Timothy. And so, as I said, this is the, the last piece of surviving correspondence that we have by the Apostle. And it's at the end of his life. And he has a lot to say here uh, about finishing the ministry and finishing our lives well. And so we want to think about some of that today. Let's look at the next uh, section, the next um, text. That's the word I'm looking for. Sorry, my, my second language is interfering with my first in my head sometimes. And so um, text is the English word I'm looking for. Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. So just after he gives his charge to Timothy, the most principal and important thing he has to say in this letter, he adds this, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, as we come to this text in your word, these words that were penned by the Apostle Paul and inspired by your Spirit, breathed out by your Spirit, Lord, we pray that the same Spirit would open our hearts now to receive these words, to uh, illumine our minds, and Lord, to help us, encourage us in every way that we too uh, might fight the good fight and finish the race that has been set before us and keep the faith into the very end. Help us, O oh Lord, we pray, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you ever have the chance to come to Milan, the, the city where, where I live and, and minister, it's a very historical city. It was the, the capital of the Roman Empire for over 100 years. And uh, Ambrose was the big man there in the times of the early church in the fourth century. Uh, he planted five churches in the city, and one of which is still functioning today as a Roman Catholic church. But inside that church, inside the crypt, uh, his remains lay there of Ambrose. Uh, he was a preacher of the word. He was a hymn writer, a church planter, defender of orthodoxy, especially the doctrine of the Trinity. He was a mentor to Augustine, and he was one of the four doctors of the early church. His body is, or what the remains are of his body, is still visible to the public eye, and it's resting between two Christian martyrs from the second century, Gervasius on one side and Protasius on the other, actually brothers who were killed during one of the many persecutions in Milan in the second century. Whatever we may think of the display uh, there as you go in and, and see it, Ambrose's legacy as a servant of Christ's church still stands as a testimony to one who, by God's grace, fought the good fight, finished his race, and kept the faith. Uh, by no means was he a perfect man, but like the Apostle Paul some 300 years earlier, he ran hard and he finished well, and his body awaits the resurrection, which the Lord Jesus has promised to all who trust in him. Uh, when I, whenever I go see it, it, it always reminds me that uh, I, too, need to cross the finish line. That crossing the finish line is really the goal of the minister, being faithful, uh, everything we heard earlier, and staying faithful until the end. Thank God we're not saved by our faithfulness. We're saved by Christ's faithfulness, which we receive by faith, faith alone. But we're called to be faithful, and that's really the goal, is to remain faithful and cross the finish line. Brothers, we're not called to be giants like Ambrose. I mean, maybe in God's grace, you will be a giant like Ambrose. But we don't need to have thoughts about that as we look at the future. 
uh, all the great and wonderful things I want to do for God. Really, staying faithful, soldier, athlete, farmer, those metaphors that Paul uses. That's our mission. And to stay faithful until the end, to press on and persevere to the end. Uh, I remember Hal Jones, who was one of my professors at Westminster Seminary some 20 years ago, uh, every time you finished a, a conversation with him, he'd always say the same thing, the same two words, press on, press on. And as I went further on in the ministry, especially now, that, those words mean so much to me. Press on, uh, keep going until, until the finish line. Sadly, a lot of ministers never make it. Uh, some of them don't make it to the finish line. And while the statistics of pastors who burn out and leave the ministry, they, they vary from one study to another, all of the data reveals an alarming number of ordained men who battle loneliness, discouragement, depression. Uh, a majority feel that they can't meet their church's unrealistic expectations. And many frequently doubt their calling. Uh, and in recent years, there's also been a troubling spike in suicides amongst pastors. Uh, and added to this are, are the numerous casualties in the ministry due to the moral failure and, and sometimes false doctrine of men that go into the ministry. Well, in, in light of all of that in, in encouraging stuff, uh, how can uh, we be encouraged to finish well? How can we press on? Uh, the Apostle Paul knew the answer. Uh, finding the determination to persevere to the end, it comes only, as we read earlier, by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, to be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, His grace that is sufficient even in the midst of our most painful trials, our most tormenting doubts, and our worst moments of weakness. His grace is sufficient. We need to find our strength not in ourselves, but in His grace, in Christ Jesus. It was only by the grace of Christ that Paul found the strength to continue during those 30 years of apostolic ministry, uh, very few of which were easy, always difficult. And finally, at the end of his life, he was able to say, by God's grace, really, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. He, he, he didn't write those words in a time of comfort or ease. He wrote them during his second Roman imprisonment, facing death. He wrote them after much difficulty. He wrote them while incarcerated, while he's lonely, cold, and without the necessary tools to redeem the time, and yet he's still full of hope. Still full of hope, for he knew that the crown of righteousness was laid up for him, and that the Lord would preserve him for his heavenly kingdom, as he goes on to say in this chapter. But convinced that his time is near, the time of his departure, that it was at hand, he, he pens these verses so that Timothy, a young man whom he loves, this young pastor at the church of Ephesus, who's timid by nature, terrified by opposition, that he would not be ashamed of Paul's imprisonment nor despair of his approaching death, but see a testimony of the sustaining grace of God, which is sufficient to strengthen us, ordinary men, and every believer to finish well. And so he says these great words that we probably know well. First, he says, fight the good fight. And in verse 7, he he, he uses the first of these three metaphors to describe how God's grace had enabled him to, to fulfill his ministry and complete his mission. I have fought the good fight, he says, an expression that could have either military or athletic connotations. Uh, the, the apostle's point is that the, the Christian ministry, I mean, as well as the entire Christian life, it, it involves a constant struggle against the spiritual forces of darkness. So earlier in the letter, you know, Paul exhorted Timothy, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ Jesus, as we read earlier. And then in his previous letter, uh, as we heard, he, he urged Timothy to wage the good warfare, 1 Timothy 1.18. And, and to fight the good fight of faith, 1 Timothy 6.12. It is a good fight, 
an honorable fight, a worthy fight, because it is fought for the glory of God and His gospel. And every minister of the Word is called to fight this good fight, to be armed with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, says Paul to the Corinthians, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into the captivity, into captivity to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. You know, as we look around at the world today, you know, I think every generation thinks, oh, these are the worst of times that we've ever seen in the history of the world. And, uh, and indeed, times are dark again now as we see uh, you know, so many things, people wanting to rearrange the order of God's creation and, and uh, categories of, of gender and, and sex and things that uh, you know, only a few generations ago people took for granted today. Now uh, it's not only tolerable uh, to say you are a, a man trapped in a woman's body or a woman trapped in a man's body, uh, it's even fashionable. And, uh, you know, we know these things, and, and as we see in, in so many challenges before us, we often think, you know, how can we pull down these strongholds? What kind of argument can stand up against them? It goes back again to the authority of God's Word and believing that authoritative Word when we stand in the pulpit. And again, it, our strength will do nothing. We're dependent upon the strength of someone else, the strength of our God, who has given us the true weapon that we need in His Word. This is why we need to be faithful in preaching that Word and proclaiming that Word. For it alone is the power of salvation. The gospel is the power of salvation. We can't open anyone's heart. We can't change anybody's heart. But the gospel can, and the gospel does. That's what we're called to proclaim. And that's the fight that we're called to fight. It's a good fight, an honorable fight, a worthy fight. We need to go fighting that fight. We can be confident that the power is in the gospel, the power to everyone who believes. It announces the promise of eternal life, and it brings forth a new creation, a new creation inaugurated by Jesus. Fighting the good fight, however, it's, uh, it's not limited to preaching the gospel and defending the faith and the, the spiritual battle of, of competing truth claims that are everywhere. There's also that subjective element in the fight and that the, the minister is uh, going to engage in with regard to his ongoing battle against the indwelling sin in his own life as well as what I often call the, the three-headed monster of worry, loneliness, and discouragement or disappointment. Worry, loneliness, and disappointment. Those, that, that monster will, will rear its three heads all the time in the ministry in one way or another. And then pastors are often hard on themselves for their own failures. Rather than resting in the absolution we receive through Christ's blood and the acceptance that is ours through His righteousness, uh, you know, I think we, we frequently we, we feel isolated by life as a, a role model uh, for the flock. Um, many pastors have very few friends, uh, if any at all, uh, in whom they can confide and speak with honestly. Uh, their families often suffer from controversies in the church and the gossip and the misbehavior of some members, uh, sometimes is done online. Uh, in other vocations also, there's that pressure. You know, we, we can see how in some vocations, uh, for example, a doctor or a lawyer, or we could even add the President of the United States, moral failure does not mean instant disqualification. But in the pastorate, uh, rarely does it not. It's almost always instant disqualification. So these are, these are, there is pressure in this fight. Uh, the standards are high, and it's not easy. And, and seeking to cope with those pressures, uh, some men in the ministry turn to artificial and unhealthy methods of self-medicating, uh, such as pornography or, or substance abuse or overeating big problem in the United States. Uh, rather than fighting the, that three-headed that three monster vigilantly 
You know, the, again, the, the worry, the loneliness, the disappointment. Um, we sometimes just try to avoid it by going into some sort of self-medication. So how can a minister fight the good fight? Well, to find the answer, we, we must consider the, the Apostle Paul. What did he do? How did he continue to find his strength in Christ? How, how was he like you, you know, the proverbial energizer bunny that just keeps going and going and going and going you know, until the end of those 30 years of ministry? Uh, well, he continued to find his strength for the fight by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Delighting in the gospel, he continued to preach the gospel. He often felt weak, as he constantly said, but he discovered that in his weakness, Christ's power is made perfect. He armed himself with the armor of God so that he could stand against the schemes of the devil. He did not neglect prayer, nor the comfort of Christian fellowship, and he was always able, it seems, to rejoice in Christ. I'm sure there were times when he found it difficult. But even in prison, as he writes that letter to the Philippians, he says, rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. Be anxious for nothing. Really, Paul, he's not, he's not on, uh, you know, a, an island in the sun someplace, uh, you know, um, sipping a, a, a cold drink. He's in prison in Rome, in difficulty. He learned to be content to find his contentment in Christ. Um, fighting the good fight really means, again, finding our strength in Christ Jesus, finding our significance in him, finding our joy in him, and going day by day with that goal to serve the meals of him to his people. Fight the good fight, he says. Finish your race is the second thing. Paul's second description of his fulfilled ministry is, I have finished the race. Uh, some years earlier, while he prepared to board a ship on the shores of Miletus, it was bound for Jerusalem. Paul addressed the elders of the Ephesians church for the last time in person, and Timothy was undoubtedly amongst them. And He declared his goal to finish the race. And this verse has been of enormous help to so many ministers as they've sought to finish the race. And in verse 24, I really uh, heartily commend to you uh, Acts chapter 20 as uh, men going into the ministry and then as you were in the ministry. Read that again and again. Uh, it is full of encouragement. But when you get to verse 24, Paul says, But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. That's really what it's all about. We want to finish the race. We want to finish well, testifying of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's really the goal. And here at the end of his life, he's able to say he had done that that by God's grace, he had finished his race. He, he makes no claim to have won the race. Uh, he was simply content to cross the finish line. And so should it be for every Christian pastor. It's not a competition. We're not seeking to, to win or to be more noticed than other people. We want to finish and cross the finish line. That's really what it is. It's, it's often the case that I think younger men, especially, especially having completed seminary, I know this was certainly the case with myself, we, we dream of doing uh, great things for God and great things for the church. And, and sadly, a lot of pastors are, are tempted to you know, measure their value on all these external things, you know, and measure the value of others as well by the, the size of their congregation or uh, the number of things that they've published or the, the number of their podcast listeners or uh, how many degrees they have. And, you know, we, we, we need to remember that the race we've been given is not a competition. It's not a competition. Christ, the righteous judge, is not looking for the runner with the fastest time or the most popularity. Uh, recognition by others does not count for anything in this race. <laughs> in fact, Christ wants runners who, who will remain dependent on his grace enduring to the end. 
That's all that really matters. In his book, uh, which I quoted earlier, Pastoral Theology, the pastor in the various duties of his office, Thomas Murphy, he issued this, this sobering warning to ambitious pastors. He said, All other motives than the constraining love of Christ in the heart soon lose their influence. There are no doubt other incentives, such as ambition, love of learning, and desire for social influence, that may carry forward a minister for a while with apparent pleasure, but they will not stand the wear and tear of years of drudgery and trial. If the pastor who is chiefly actuated by these is successful, they will soon satiate. If he is not as successful as he expected to be, he becomes discouraged and disgusted with his office. If there is nothing more than these, the ministry soon becomes a miserable failure. But when the love of Christ reigns in the heart supremely, he gives an impulse to the whole life that is ever steady and joyous. The wear and tear of toiling years will not wear it out. Sometimes there may appear only little success, but it has a faith that lays hold of the promises and is not discouraged. Through prosperity or adversity, among friends or enemies, in failing or continuing health, it moves steadily forward, impelled by an inward affection that cannot be quenched. That's really it, brothers. That's really it. Paul doesn't tell Timothy, Timothy, do great things for God. He doesn't say that here. He says, endure suffering, be an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, fight the good fight, run the race. In fact, Christ has already won the race. We don't have to win it, worry about winning. He's won. And the rest of us are simply called to stay the course and finish without dropping out or, or becoming disqualified or running off on a trail someplace, but finishing the race. So fight the good fight. Finish the race. And then he says, keep the faith. His third affirmation about the, the, the completion of his service is, I have kept the faith. He had faithfully guarded the, the good deposit that had been given to him, uh, that, that was entrusted to him. And now, again, he's passing that torch to Timothy, to the next generation, and he's saying, now you go do the same. The faith, in note the, the definite article there, the faith, not just faith, is a reference to the gospel and the central Christian doctrine, the, the body of faith. Paul had already warned Timothy in, in this letter about those who have strayed concerning the truth, chapter 2, verse 18, and are dis disapproved concerning the faith, chapter 3, verse 8. Now Timothy must live according to the example of his spiritual father, Paul, and keep the faith to the end. And that's in accordance with Paul's earlier exhortation. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me and the, the good things that was committed to you keep by the Holy Spirit who indwells in us. Chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Sadly, some ministers have failed to finish the race because they've embraced false teaching or uh, they didn't keep the faith. Uh, some have abandoned the faith altogether. Some have cr kissed Christianity goodbye. Uh, but the church needs faithful ministers of the word who, who, will, who will guard the purity of the gospel and the apostolic doctrine, bringing it to the next generation. This is one of the reasons why it's so important that you're here at this school, that you're getting a good theological foundation and education. Because this is, in so many ways, is... Uh, the, the foundation, the concrete slab upon which you're going to stand for so long. It's Christ and, and the apostolic gospel. And so take it seriously, your studies, all of it, uh, because so much of this is going to matter for you as you seek to keep the faith for many years to come. Uh, do your best in, in, here in school uh, not to be recognized by others, but so that you'll be able to keep the faith going forward year after year, decade after decade, and pass the, the torch on to the next generation. It's a high calling, brothers, a huge calling that's being given to you. The last thing is to expect a reward. Expect a reward. 
Yes, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, completely. And yet God in his great grace is delighted to reward us. And here Paul talks about that. In, in verse 8, Paul rejoice, rejoices in what awaits him. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. Again, in the Olympic Games, there were, he's drawing upon this imagery of, of sports, you know, uh, that, that he often uh, draws upon or, or, or paints. And, uh, you know, the, the, in the ancient world, the, the wreaths of honor would be placed like crowns upon the, the heads of winners. And, and here he, he's using that metaphor, the crown of righteousness, to describe the, the permanent and perfect state of righteousness that will be ours in glory. Uh, this is the righteousness which Christ alone has earned for us, you know, through his act of obedience to the Father. It's already been imputed to the sinner who, who trusts in Christ because it's God who justifies and declares righteous all those who receive this righteousness by faith alone. Uh, and nevertheless, justified believers uh, are not yet glorified. Uh, although God has already given us the righteousness of Christ and God already regards the believer as righteous on account of the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, he has not yet brought the believer to completion. And so in this life, as we know, we're still uh, undergoing that slow process and often painful and tedious lifelong process of sanctification and being made more righteous internally. And we long for that sanctification to be complete. You know, we're waiting for that day when we will be glorified and when, when sin will be no more in our, in our, our heart, our soul, our mind, our, our words, our thoughts, our deeds. That's the crown of righteousness that, that Paul says is laid up for him. And we will enjoy it, not just in soul, but also in body, in the resurrection, in, in glorification. Already justified, not yet glorified. And it is that great inheritance that Peter describes as incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. This is why he could stare death in the face, Paul, and, and say, the time, the time of my departure is at hand. But there's a reward waiting for me. And we might think, well, yeah, of course Paul got a reward. I mean, he's Paul. Look what he did. But he says it's not just for him alone. It's for all of us, all who have trusted in Jesus, even the weakest. Again, the, a weak faith receives a whole Christ. You get as much Christ as Paul got, even with your weakest faith. And you get the privilege now of making that same Christ known. This is a reward that's for us, not only to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. The same crown of righteousness that awaited Paul, awaited Timothy, and it awaits you. So run, fight, keep. Do you love the appearing of Christ? Do, do you rejoice in what he accomplished through his life, death, and resurrection? Are you longing for his return? Are you, are you longing for the time when he will bring all evil to an end and destroy the last enemy, death, forever, then the crown is for you too. So in light of that, run, fight, keep. It's only because of Jesus that we get that crown. And we're winners of the race because of him who won in our place. He's the one who fought, fought the good fight perfectly, fulfilling all of righteous demands of God's law through his act of obedience to the Father. He's the one who loved his neighbor impeccably and resisted temptation unwaveringly and conquered Satan decisively. At the end of his life, he was able to say to the Father, I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory that I had with you before the world was. And then the next day, as he hung upon the cross for our sins, suffering the wrath of God for us, the sins of those whom the Father had given to him, his last words were, it is finished. It is finished. He finished his race. He completed his mission. He won the prize for us. 
Uh, the crown of righteousness, therefore, is a gift of grace from beginning to end. And so that's the consolation and the encouragement that we receive that, that brings us joy and gratitude in the mission that sometimes is very difficult and can be discouraging. It, it, it's, it's what invigorates us, really, to fight the good fight and to, to, to run the race and to, to keep the faith the victory is ours because of Christ. God accepts us and loves us, not because of how well we are fighting or how fast we are running, but because of how well his son did. And that's the comfort that brings us great joy, even when we feel weak, too weak to fight or too weary to run. It's the gospel. As be strengthened in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. This is what Paul has to say to Timothy at the end of his life. And it's what God wants us to know too, brothers. The good news strengthens us to fight the good fight and to finish the race, looking always to Jesus. For in him, we are already victorious. That's the key to finding the motivation and encouragement we need to keep going. Look to Christ. He's the key to finishing well. In Christ said Ambrose. We can circle back to him. We have everything. If you find yourself oppressed by guilt, he is your righteousness. If you are in need of help, he is your strength. If you are afraid of death, he is the life. If you desire heaven, he is the way. If you need refuge from the darkness, he is the light. Oh, may God strengthen us by his grace that is in Christ Jesus so that we too can finish well. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for the opportunity to reflect upon your word and to reflect upon uh, this last letter of the Apostle Paul to Timothy. Lord, we pray that uh, you would carry it in our hearts by the power of your spirit. We pray, Lord, that we would find our strength, not in ourselves, but in the gospel, in the grace that is in your Son. Help us always, Lord, to find our sufficiency, not in our performance, but in the performance of Jesus. And may we find our joy in him and our desire to make him known. Oh, Lord, may it always increase. Be with my brothers, Lord, as they continue their studies, as they prepare for the future. Watch over them, bless them, keep them, O oh Lord. Strengthen them in faith, hope, and love, and use them as your tools, Lord. Make them faithful. Help them to be soldiers and athletes and farmers, O oh Lord, for your glory and your glory alone. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.